Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our Voices for Healing and Justice Symposium. Uh, we have a feedback form on the table and for those of you joining, it on, joining us online, there will be one that appears in your browser afterwards. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us our alumna, Dawn C. Hill. Dawn is a member of the Mohawk Nation Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. She's a registered social worker. She has over 18 years of social work experience in a variety of settings with a variety of clients. She currently works as a clinical social worker at the Six Nations Family Health Team located in historical downtown Oshuigan. Dawn grew up at the Tuscarora Reservation in Lewiston, New York. She received both her BA in community mental health and her Master of Social Work from the University of Buffalo. Dawn's social work practice focuses on more than day-to-day -day patient assessment. She envisions herself as an advocate, human rights activist, a social worker committed to social justice, fighting for oppressed communities and marginalized individuals, an advocate of community engagement who believes in making a transformational regional impact. For the past 15 years, <clears throat> Dawn has been writing short memoir stories about her family and her time growing up with 13 siblings. Memory Keeper, her first published collection. Dawn's stories depict anecdotes, however comedic or horrific, from her life on the res. These stories help her to circumnavigate constructively the residual pain and dysfunction that is the legacy of the res residential school system. As a registered social worker and community health worker, Dawn doesn't, have, doesn't leave the reader impacted by the shock and trauma of her stories. Instead, she offers a small workbook companion with a published collection as a healing resource for her reader, readers. Let's give Dawn a warm welcome. Sago, Sublego, Yungyats, Dawn Hill. In the hog and you are from Sodu, Anola, you are the Lodu, the Peter on a Schwagen. Excuse me, that's Corora and Nundage. So, what I'm saying is that, um, hello everybody, my name is Dawn Hill and I am a Mohawk. My clan is Turtle. And I live in Ashwigan, and I came originally from Tuscarora, and that is in Mohawk. I was recently taking a Mohawk class before the pandemic hit, and then I, I resigned because it was just too much to do that full time. Working as a social worker, my kids were exploded, so I just kind of put that on hold, maybe till I retire, and I'll get back to it. But I really wanted to learn my language, which is what my my mom lost, and she was at this much. Um, I did want to go to this land acknowledgement um, because I think it's pretty important to, to acknowledge that. Um, thank you. It's pretty important to, to acknowledge that the land that, that University at Buffalo is on is traditional Seneca land. And um, also there is a lot of um, nations who still live here. The, the Skorori, Tuscarora nation is very close as well over in Lewiston, Sanborn area. Um, I know there's a lot of Mohawk, the Yagahaga people, a lot of Kiyuga, um, which say Diacono. I'm not going to say Anadaga in the language because I can't say it <laughs> or Seneca in the language. But yeah, there's still a lot of indigenous people who live and work on these territories. Um, and the territory that we're on is also covered by that one dish and one spoon wampum. And to me, it's about always being open to help others. You know, if somebody shows up, you help them in any way that you can, whether it's feed them, you know, open your home to them, that's what that's about. Um, so I think that to begin, I just wanted to start with a reading from my book. I'm just going to read the, the first little chapter. Maybe I should say this back up and say that this book was not originally intended to be a book at all. This was just me writing kind of as therapy, writing as therapy for myself. I was 
um, you know, working as a social worker. I was raising a family, um, doing internships, and I was pretty, you know, I had a full plate, and sometimes it was a lot, and uh, I was off work for about nine months at one point, and um, so that's when I really started writing. Every day I wrote something. Never really intended to to write, to put it together as a collection at all. To me, it was like EMDR. You know, um, I'm in the processing, and you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, so for me, writing was like EMDR in that I wrote stories that were very, very detailed. I got things out of my head and onto paper, and in doing so, I cut that emotional tether to those memories. So when those memories came up again, whether they were triggered or whether they just came to my mind, the emotional um, dysregulation didn't come along with it. I no longer wanted to, you know, that fight or flight. My, my, my heart didn't start racing. I didn't want to run out of the room. Instead, it was just a memory. Like, yeah, I walked to the store and I got candy as a kid. It no longer impacted me the way it once did because I wrote it all down. And, and process it through writing. So I am going to write a story and I did grab a book. So hold on, let me just grab a book out of my book page. I think I'm going to read a story called Sticking Span first. And, um, I woke up one morning and my first thought was of my mother. I thought about the two pictures that were sent to me on Facebook. They reminded me of mugshots that were taken when you're getting arrested and processed. When you're facing a night in the slammer after some altercation or beaching some law. One was a side profile, that one. The other one was a, a full-on frontal of a nine-year-old face. This nine-year-old girl hadn't lied about anything, hadn't stolen anything, hadn't assaulted anyone. Her only crime was being born brown in a world that doesn't value that color. Um, she hadn't been arrested or processed through any judicial system for her crime of being an Angwehoi child. Angwehoi means like the original. She wasn't about to spend a night or two in this holding cell referred to as the mush bowl. She spent seven years there from the age of nine until she turned 16. Um, I'm just going to show a picture. That is the Mush Hole. That is the Mohawk Institute residential school that is in Brantford, Ontario, near my mother's home reservation of Six Nations. Um, she spent seven years there. Okay, I can't understand how government and church can somehow rationalize taking children forcefully from their parents and community in order to strip them down with the intention to remove all inner traces of their nativeness. Their language banned and rebranded as filthy talk of the savages. Those children's belief system was also stripped away. Whatever their traditional beliefs were, they were also rebranded as civil beliefs, evil beliefs of the pagans. How could she be called that just because her belief system was not that ascribed to by the dominant culture? I imagined her alone, confused, away from her family, the beliefs that tied her to her reality and her knowledge of what is right and wrong were broken. What happened to her when everything she was taught as right was not pointed out to her as wrong? All her beliefs, her language, crushed and broken at her feet. My mother was a strong person. She survived the soul-crushing re-education and indoctrination machine somehow. I thought about myself as a nine-year-old and the many times I encountered racism in my young life. I remembered a field trip when I was in the fifth grade. We were taken to a bowling alley down in Lewiston, New York. 
I was standing in line at the counter, just about to rent the ugly bowling shoes. And the man was standing next to me at the counter. He looked down and he said, I smell shit. I was surprised at first to hear this offhanded remark, not really understanding what he was inferring. I hadn't shat myself. I bathed that morning. I had not stepped in dog shit. There were no remnants on my shoes, I checked. Um, I knew how to wipe my own ass. I washed my hands thoroughly afterwards. I just kept checking off things in my head. I knew it couldn't be me. Suddenly, the realization hit me that what he really meant was that I was a piece of shit. I was the stench in his nostrils. It was me, this little brown indigenous girl invading his territory. I wasn't where I belonged. I was off the res. This white man in his in, in denim coveralls with his plaid shirt frayed at the hems, wearing rubberized work boots that were probably covered in pig shit, was standing there in judgment over me, a child. I don't think people are born to be racist bastards. <laughs> I think it's a learned belief. They're taught by their families, social or political groups, in which all indigenous people, or insert any other ethnic minority group here, are different, are dirty, are less than. That all Indians, and I want to do like this when I say Indians, <laughs> are drunkards. All Indians are lazy. All Indians are on welfare. All merciless Indian savages, heathens, pagans. These messages become internalized beliefs that the person doesn't question. They don't go out and they don't do a scientific study to see if all natives do in fact fit in within those parameters. Or if they do, do meet a native person who doesn't drink, has an advanced degree, holds down a professional position, they are looked upon as an anomaly, an outlier. My aunts often stated proudly that they learned to cook and clean at the mush bowl. They learned how to sew, do laundry properly, iron clothes. They were trained to be domestics because, of course, back then in the 1930s, they couldn't become anything else. Could they? A good work ethic was instilled or maybe beaten into them. Back when they were at the Mush Bowl, the dominant culture did not value our indigenous cultural beliefs. They didn't believe that we could achieve any kind of advanced degrees, or a professional level of educational status. All my mom and her sisters were taught to aspire to was to be the best housekeeper slash domestic that they could be. What I really yearned to know was the collective memories of my mom and her sisters, to be privy to all that they saw and heard while interned there. I wanted to know their psychological scars and how they were changed by their time spent there. None of them were ever branded with an assigned number on their arms like the Holocaust survivors were, yet they endured abuse, they endured pain, they endured starvation, they faced linguistic and cultural obliteration. What they suffered is what I needed to know. How did becoming survivors after all they bore change their brains, change their beliefs, what did their confinement do to them? What is the legacy of abuse, neglect, cultural genocide? Thank you. Um, when I was writing these stories, you know, all those questions kept, you know, going through my head. Um, coming here to UB and learning so much about trauma, you know, even taking that trauma certificate course in addition to my course here. Trauma was something that I was really interested in. I wanted to know the impact of trauma on our brains, on our bodies. You know, they talk about epigenetics, they talk about our DNA aging and change. And I really think that that is so, right, you know, blood memory. Um, so that was kind of where my whole interest in, in finding out what trauma does to people. How does it impact you for the rest of your life? And I just want to share one more story. This is the first chapter. 
And maybe I should have started here, but I love that other chapter too, because to me, it just seems that even though, you know, it's 2020, racism is still out there, you know, the stereotypes are still out there about us. Um, this is called Dissociation Part One, and I'm just going to take a quick drink of some. So my mom and I sat across from each other at the table on an unseasonably warm Indian summer in 1979. The dining room table sat at the far end of the living room. Behind the table was an oversized mahogany buffet that was chock full of my mom's beads and beadwork in various stages of completion. In the corner of the room was her matching mahogany curved glass china cabinet that held all her treasures. Our dining room table was so old, it could probably have qualified as an antique. It was a rectangular table with carved spindly barley twist legs that were joined together with a cross stretcher underneath that probably gave it enough strength and stability to remain standing even after a family of 15 had gathered around it for hundreds of meals. It had a white and scorch mark on the top where somebody probably had set down a hot pan on one side of the table was a bench that my father had engineered many years before I was even born. It was made of two by fours with some type of rough hewn planks nailed on top with the apron on each side. At one time it was painted John Deere green, but you could barely see that as the wood and the paint had been worn smooth and shiny by all the children seated upon it over the years. None of the chairs matched, and whatever fabric upholstery that once covered the seat of my chair was long gone. I could feel something crinkly underneath my leg as I sat there in my jeans and Oxford button-down shirt. I was home for the weekend from Cuca College, an all-girls college in the Finger Lakes region of New York. I was working on a paper about trauma, and I wanted to ask my mom all about her experiences when she was in the mush hole as a child. At that time, I wasn't even aware of the official name that it had went by, the Mohawk Institute. I only knew that everyone called it the mush bowl. And the reason they called it the mush bowl was because that's all the children were fed morning, noon, and night was mush, oatmeal. And sometimes that mush had mealy worms in it, and they had to eat it. That's all they had. Sometimes, once in a while, they would have like some broth that maybe had remnants of some, you know, vegetables that they had raised and sent to market, maybe a little bit of, you know, scraps of meat, but for them, by and large, it was oatmeal from all the people that I spoke to. Um, and I lost my spot. Okay, I only knew that everyone called it the mush hole. I had a pen in my hand and a notebook and I was ready to fill it up with all my mother's reminiscences about her time as a child interned there with her two sisters. She never spoke of it, so I wasn't even sure which two sisters were with her at the mush bowl. It was probably about 10.30 on a Saturday morning. My mom had been up for a while and was sitting at the table beating. Her long salt and pepper hair was braided and pinned up behind her head. That morning, it was a little unruly and wisps of it stood up around her face. My mom was once a beauty. After birthing and raising 10 children and living a life full of hard knocks, she looked older than her 54 years. She had on an orange paisley pattern house dress and a pair of brown polyester pants underneath it. I'm sure her sister, Mary Penny, had made those pants for her. The moo moo might also have been a creation of my auntie Pen too. My mom, Hazel Leona Van Every Hill, was born on the Six Nations Reservation in Ashree, Ontario, in 1925. She was the eldest of 10 children born to Titus Benigri and Vera Beula Thomas. My mom shared the same dark complexion of her father, as well as his rather prominent proboscis. Her grandpa Ty nose was passed on to my sister Dolores and my brothers David and Ty. I can imagine myself practically dancing down those stairs because I wanted to get a jump start on this paper. I wanted to get it outlined, drafted, and hopefully ready to type up once I got back to Cuco. I sat across from her, set my paper and pen down, and I started to explain that I had just completed a paper on the Jewish Holocaust. 
And um, I mentioned how I wanted to write about her experiences at residential school. I wanted to contrast and compare her experiences with cultural and linguist, linguistic genocide to that of the straight up genocide that the Jewish people experienced in Nazi Germany. I especially wanted to know how she and her sisters ended up at the mush hole, how long they stayed there, what she had learned, what happened, what it was like. I began with a simple question of, how old were you when you went there? At that moment, my mom changed before my eyes. She disappeared. Her eyes went blank and it seemed like she suddenly had her maybe always had mixtating eyelids. Somehow, I never noticed it. It looked like this other membrane had suddenly, unexpectedly swept across her eye and she no longer saw me or the room we sat in. I could imperceptibly hear a gate slam and shut around her. I continued to talk and I kept asking her questions, but she had morphed into that girl with the faraway eyes from that Rolling Stone song. I couldn't reach her anymore. It hit me like a sledgehammer. I was seeing someone dissociate. However, it wasn't someone in the midst of a therapy session, it was my mom. This was way too real and frightening. I thought it was all my fault. What I was studying at college and textbooks about psychological pathology had somehow led this chicken to come home to roost. She was definitely disconnected from her thoughts, possibly her own identity in that moment. I always believed my professors when they said that the mind is a very powerful thing. And in that moment, it was giving her a way out. She had shut down, she had opted out, she was emotionally detached. I felt the cold hand of fear on my, my neck. Panic began to rise within me. My biggest fear was that I was never gonna get her back. I called her name, Ma, Mom, Mommy. But that voice, my voice didn't seem to register anywhere within her. I put my hand on her shoulder and she flinched. She pulled away, louder, I said, Ma, Mom, can you hear me? Slowly, she relaxed a little bit and she blinked. Her eyes changed and she seemed to regain some focus. She looked at me, but she didn't say anything. It was taking her a little bit longer to process my presence. I completely lost my desire to ask her any more questions. I didn't want to trigger more unpleasant or hurtful memories for her. She finally said she was okay. And then she picked up her needle and she continued beating the edge on the barrette she was working on. There was no more to say. All the questions I had were gone, left unasked. Whatever conversation we might have had was never to be. My concern for her emotional well-being far overshadowed my desire for answers in the moment. It's been over 40 years since I attempted to expose my mother's tenuous connection to the memories of her childhood. I never tried to dredge up her recollections again. Over time, a thought occurred to me. In her silence, was she protecting herself or was she protecting me? Um, I thought often about um, all that my mother might have endured at the Mush Bowl with her two sisters. And um, in September of 2017, when I had moved from Tuscarora over to Six Nations, they had an orange shirt day. Orange shirt day is, you know, remembrance of those children who are at residential school. So I wanted to go. I wanted to go and, and, and you know, to, it was at the Mush Bowl and I wanted to be there and see what was going to, you know, what, what the program was going to be about. So I have an older sister who lives at Six Nations and I asked her, I said, hey, will you come with me? I don't want to go alone. And she was like, absolutely not, I'm not going. I am not going to be an ajitulis. Ajitulis in Mohawk means a crybaby. I'm not going to be a crybaby all day at that place. I'm not going. And I said, come on, I'll buy you a t-shirt. <laughs> that wasn't enough. She said, no, I'm not going. So September 30th, 2017, I got in my car and I went and drove from Six Nations to the Mohawk Institute, which is now known as the Woodland Cultural Center. 
and which is still standing today because all of the people at Six Nations, they kind of did a, um, a vote. Do we want it torn down because of all the horrific things that happened there? Or do we want to save the evidence? Because if it's gone, nobody can ever point to the place and say that's where it all happened. A lot of people were torn. Some want it torn down because it just brought so many bad memories. They didn't even like to go down Mohawk Road that it was on because it just, it, they, they go elsewhere. They go around it. They won't look at it. They won't go down that road. And the other people said, we have to say that has to be there, you know, in the memory of all those children who were there, who lost their lives. So it is still there. So that day I went to this memorial service and the minute I was on, you know, the, the campus, I guess you call it, I just felt that, you know, trembling inside of me the whole day and tears all day. I was the biggest Ojibwe issue ever seen. I couldn't stop the flow of those tears if I wanted to. I just had a bunch of Kleenex mopping it up, trying not to sob, you know, listening to all these different elders who had been there as children who stood up and, you know, shared their, their recollections and shared um you know, maybe an opening talking in their language and just hearing their language, whether it was Anishinaabe or Mohawk or whatever it was, it, that too was just so powerful. And um, I remember that day, this one guy, he stood up there and he had been there. And when he was older, he was released and he went back to his reserve way up north. And um, he said, you know, I, I went back and I couldn't speak my language anymore, and, and my parents weren't there anymore, but my grandparent was still there, his grandfather. And so he lived with his grandfather. And he said one day, he said to his grandfather, you know, in, in Mohawk, it would be love a me. No, oh, that's, oh, I can't even, sorry, you know, I'm feeling bad. Anyway, to his grandfather, he said, um, you know, what is truth? Grandpa, what is truth? And the grandpa, you know, he just sounded like such a wise guy. Why, not, not a wise guy, you know, forget about it, but a wise man. And he said, you know, truth, he said, is like a line that goes from you all the way out forever. And there's going to be days when you walk through that truth and you know it in that moment. He says, but I want to know what truth is, my boy. There will be moments you'll know the truth, but I want to know all of it. You won't ever know all of that truth until, you know, someday. And that other place, you know the truth. And that just, you know, of course, ah, like a big edgy device. It was just so real. And then he talked about how on the ground there, his daughter took a picture of his grandson. And when they looked at that picture, there was two little boys standing there, not one. And that too, that story as he said it, you know, the hackles on the back of my neck stood up and I, I knew it was right. I knew it was true because to me, there were so many little souls still there. Afterwards, after all the survivors, everybody ate. Oh, while I was eating, I was eating and something, I was sitting there talking to my sister-in-law and all of a sudden, the color just had drained out of my face. She said, what happened? What, 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 what happened? And I said, something just grabbed my ankle under the table. And I looked down and I wanted to say it was probably just a cat or dog touched me, went by me, but it felt like something had touched my leg and it just, yeah. I know that right now they have all of the, the grounds all mapped out, you know, spray painted. And, and there's a survivor secretariat that all of the survivors are on and they are um, the ones who are directing the search right now for unmarked graves on that, on that campus, on that area. And to me, my biggest worry is, you know, what's gonna happen to our community when they find bodies there? And I know you will. And because it's the survivors, they are going by what they know, what they've been told. There's bodies here, there's bodies there. I heard they put bodies over here. There's bodies in the dump. So I know that those little ones are gonna be found and it's gonna be hard on our community, just like it has on other communities across Canada. So um, I wanted to read a poem written by my son. And this poem I think was 
not want to say the big impetus, but it just really made me stop and think about what is it that happened to my mother? What is it that she endured, that she survived, that she changed from? So let me just have another drink. Okay. Um, and as a matter of fact, my son is sitting here today. Jordan. He was 17 when he wrote this poem. He was um, a senior at Nairobi High School in Sanborn. And he brought this poem home to me one day and I read it. And I, again, I did the least cried. I couldn't read this poem for a long time. I couldn't because it just made me lose it. But I'm, I'm getting there. I've got it now. Okay, so this is entitled Mushhole. Little Indian girl on a train to a school so far, far away from the land of her life's blood. I am with her and I am her, as are countless others, on a train to a school filled with notions of civilization and the sorrows of many nations, with secret meetings in closets so that we could talk that tongue that is our life's blood, so that we could hold that dream in our hands of growing up free. But it was all overshadowed by civilization and brutal beatings and things we couldn't understand. Grandma never spoke those life-giving words ever again, nor have I. Jordan Welby Spiders. I wanted to just go on and touch on really quickly, you know, um, writing as healing, and also talk a little bit about um, land-based healing. I'll just talk about Friday morning at Six Nations, they had a, um, a little teaching, I guess I would call it. We all gathered and we went into the bush and um, we walked back about three or four fields where there was um, a clearing and a little lean to built and there was just buckets and buckets and buckets on all of these maple trees, you know, that they were collecting the sap. And so we built this, I, I don't look at him as an elder because he seemed like he was younger than me, <laughs> but his name was Rod Miller and he was so knowledgeable, you know, about land-based healing. It was just wonderful to be there in the bush, even though it started snowing that morning. It was just beautiful standing out there. And, and um, I said to him, what, you know, I, I wonder, you know, my question is, I wonder is who would ever first think about, you know, putting a hole in the tree and waiting for all this sap to come out. And he says, I have a story for that. And so we all sat down, they had a circle with all of these little tree stumps. So he sat down and he told us this story about how, you know, it was getting to be the end of winter because they've already had their midwinter ceremonies, you know, and the weather was starting to break and they were running low on their stores of food and corn and dried meat and all that back in the day. So he, this one, warrior, whatever you want to call him, um, the holy man, Haudenosaunee guy, he left the, um, the longhouse and he went out and thinking, I got to get some food. I got to gather something for us. We're, we're running low. So he was out walking and walking and walking. He never saw any game. He never saw nothing that he could bring back. And so he thought, I'm, I'm not even going to make it back. I don't have enough energy. I can't do it. So he sat down, kind of slumped against the tree and he saw these squirrels and they were going up to this tree and they were like drinking or eating something and he kept watching them and after that you know they were doing somersaults and backflips maybe not but you know sounds good in the story and so he kept watching them and he thought what are they doing you know where are they getting all that energy they just got energized and so he went over there with his knife and he cut a little hole and he saw the sap start running out and he was collecting it and he was drinking it and right away he felt his energy increase and he thought oh, you know I got to bring this back to to the, to the longhouse, to the people. They got to know about this. And he went back and he gathered people and they gathered whatever they could that would hold this sap, this, you know, it is, it's, it's sap because it isn't made into syrup yet. And they brought it back and everybody was replenished and rejuvenated because it's like medicine, you know. And I even got to drink some and it did taste just like fresh water, but with a little sweetness to it. It was awesome. I said, yes, I'm ready to do a backflip now. <laughs> <laughs> and then he shared some more about, you know, 
prophecies. And one of the things he, he talked about was, you know, long ago, all the older guys would, would say that, you know, the elders, that there's going to be a day when you're going to have to buy water. And they laughed and they thought that was funny. They're like, oh, I'm going to get a bucket out of the well. And I'm going to sit at the road and sell it. And, you know, and here it is, you know, we have to buy water. What comes out of the tap, just, I'm afraid to drink it. Why live in a Sweden? So, yeah, I buy water too. And another um, prophecy he talked about was that, um, you know, they said that there's going to come a day when the trees, they're going to start dying from the top down, not from the roots up, but from the top down. And you see that now. Yeah, it was, it was a very interesting day. I really enjoyed it. And I did. I just felt so calm, so you know, everything that had been on my plate up until then was gone because he did a um, meditation where we had to close our eyes and he talked us through this whole meditation. And it was about being in a, in a long house back in the day, waking up, you know, when you're on your little cot and you're in there and you can smell the fire and you, you know, you get up and all the people are talking and the fires are getting lit down the line because a long house, uh, the whole village lived in there. So it was pretty, it was awesome. I had a very good day. And after that, I did feel very relaxed and let go of so much that was going on in my mind. Um, so I think I'm just going to go. This is Thomas Indian School. It is down in Cataraugus. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. Oh, I will mention this here. Turtle, my son drew. The Indian Act, yeah, over in Canada denied status to women. Women who married men lost their status. If, if a woman married a man who was not from her reserve, she lost status. Whereas if a non-native woman married a man, she gained status. So that changed in 1986 with Bill C-31, introduced residential school, created reserves, renamed us with European names. Um, So like eventually school legacy, yeah, that's what it's all about is that, um, you know, we were all gathered up and sometimes taken right off the streets and put in these schools and told that our languages were wrong. Oh, look at that weaver. I wonder who that could be. Uh huh. <laughs> Absolutely. Told that our languages were wrong, that they were just, you know, evil, bad, not right. And then that just really tore people down. The whole Fort Carlisle school, um, Colonel Richard Pratt started the whole thing by saying, yeah, we got to kill the man to save the Indian. Kill that, or kill the, oh, I got that backwards. Don't I? Kill the Indian, save the man. Oh, Lord, I can, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and actually, in February, I went to, um, visit my daughter down at Penn State and on the way home I saw Carlisle you know on on the overheads and I'm like oh. and I just pulled off the highway and I went there and I put it in my GPS to go to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School it was like eight miles away from where I got off the highway and I had never been there before Whew, I got there and you know that feeling I had it I had it there for, it was just shaky I just felt shaky and I felt sick being there. And I don't, yeah. I, my sisters explained that same feeling when they went to Manzanar out in California and that internment camp where they kept the Japanese. They said walking around there in that area where all these Japanese used to be, that's the feeling they felt too that, oh, shit, he's sick, not right, something's wrong here. That's what I felt there. And I, my, my, um, GPS says, you've arrived at your destination, and I was in a parking lot for an Amway store. So I got out, and I went in, and I asked the guy, do you know where this Carlisle Indian Industrial School is? And he looked at me and said, oh, no, no, I don't. Never heard of it. Mm -mm, don't know nothing about it. And I was kind of taken aback because, you know, how could you not know? But I walked out. He said, but there is an uh, Army Depot next door. So I just drove that way, and about 100 feet was this great big sign. That great big sign was that sign right there. 
was just on the other side of the railroad tracks. That's all that separated his parking lot from that. But he looked at me, he was out of the eye and said, no, nope, never heard of it. And across the street were all these little gravestones of children with names on them like Jack and I, I don't even know. Yeah, it was, it was pretty emotional just seeing that. But they did not save the evidence there. There's no building that you can go to. And so I went I, I went back to my car, and I saw where it said visitor center. So I drove there, and the road that I had to turn down was called Jim Thorpe Road. And my step-grandfather actually went to Carlisle with Jim Thorpe. So I drove over to, to this, the building, but it was closed. So then I had to leave to this checkpoint and the, the men in the checkpoint were already had, had already been yelling at me, lady, get your car off the road. And it was off the road and it was like 8.30 in the morning and there was no traffic, but they, they were like, you know, I felt like I was being heckled. So I pulled up to their, their little checkpoint and, you know, I have a Canadian plate on my car, but they looked at me and they say, man, do you have some US government ID? So I reached in my little purse and I got out my U.S. passport because I was born here. And he didn't even take it. He didn't even look at it. He didn't even see if it was mine. He was like, oh, go through. So, you know, that little feeling I had that, that day. I, I felt it still. Mm -hmm. So I just want to quickly talk about... Oh, I want to talk about that real quick, culture. You know, to me, culture is, is pretty complex. That little doll there um, is a doll that was made by this lady from my reserve called Mildred Garlow. She's long gone, but all her work was done in purple, purple velvet, and that's what that little dress is. And to me, beadwork is a big piece of our culture. Those pots, those are from Six Nations. That little, it's a strawberry basket that was made up in St. Regis. And all my books, I like that one right there. If you could poison us, yeah. All right, anyway, so moving mm -hmm. yeah. on. Um, I did give this to Michelle, so she can go ahead and send it to you guys if she wants to. But this is what I really wanted to talk about, that expressive writing can be so healing for people. And like I said, it can be, to me, it was like, you know, because I've done EMDR and um, with, with my clients and myself, and that's what it feels like, cutting those emotional tethers to those, that emotional dysregulation that we feel sometimes. It helps to reduce the stress, the anxiety, you know, those rumoring, um, perseverating, I can't even talk today. <laughs> All those thoughts, those racing thoughts, you know, that you just get stuck on something. It helps to get that all out. It helps your mind to have some clarity. And um, yeah, it helps us to make sense of our, our own story, narrative therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So in guided, detailed writing is helpful too. One of the things that I talked to my um, supervisor at work is that, you know, once COVID, you know, is done and we can do groups and meet, I want to do like a 10 week writing group. You know, I want to teach writing as healing. I think that would be wonderful. I think that would be so helpful. Because sometimes people don't want to give voice to what's going on and if they can write it. And I haven't talked to my publisher yet, but I'd like to maybe put together a little book to get writing. So I think that would be amazing. And I think that's the biggest thing is that it has to be authentic. It has to be genuine. It has to be your voice, right? For that healing to happen. Um, yeah, telling a story in a really coherent, complex way. Even if they're little short stories, those are so helpful to get that out. Transformative, I think that's a big word for sure. It transforms all that chaos that's going on in your mind and it gets it all out. I like to call it a brain dump. 
I really, you know, practice that with my clients is I want you to go home and I want you to get out a piece of paper and I want you to just sit there, give yourself 10 minutes, 15, 20, whatever you need and write everything that's going on in your head and bring it to us, to me. And let's look for themes in that. Let's, let's check that out. See, what, see what's going on in there. So, yeah, I think writing is healing. I know it is. <laughs> Storytelling is healing. I mean, I love to tell stories. I do. Get a lot of those is she tells stories. And that's what I do. And that's, you know, all that intergenerational, transgenerational, all of that trauma is in there. And I think by writing, I think this would be a really good thing for the community once, you know, we get the results of all of those radar from penetrating radar, we're gonna need something to help community for sure. When we talk. My caseload has already explored, I can't even imagine what it's gonna be like. Why is land important? because there's a connectedness, there's that reciprocity with the land. It's really important to who we are. You know, I look at us as stewards, right, of that, of that land. Um, and land-based healing, as we were walking back from the um, collecting the sap, I asked Rod, I said, what, how would you describe land-based healing? Because, you know, there's not much out there. I did a literature search, literature search <laughs> and there wasn't much to be had. And he said, yeah. He said to me, it's about living. It's about being on the land. That's what it is, you know? He said, this guy came up to me. He goes, whew, I found this really great therapy. It is gonna help everybody. It's so cool. I gotta tell you about it. He said, what is it? You take your shoes off and you go outside and you walk out in the bush and on the grass. And I found out that, you know, the earth has a heartbeat. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> so it's like once science in, in Western medicine catch up, then it's real, right? But until then, yeah, that's how I see it. That's, uh, to me, that's what land-based healing is about. It's just, I, I look at it too as mindfulness, right? A mindfulness practice. And, and this is one of the things that I ask my clients to do when they're having so much trouble with anxiety, you know, panic attacks. It's, okay, here's what I want you to do. I even did this on the phone with somebody because I've been working from home doing phone counseling, if you can imagine. I could never imagine that when I was here going to school ever. Uh, you had to be in the room, you had to have to see their, you know, their affect, and you had to see their body language. I couldn't imagine doing it on the phone. I've been doing it for two years on the phone, and it's doing all right. But the one girl, she was like, couldn't breathe, was crying. I said, take your phone and walk outside. Go outside, it was really windy that day. I said, look up in the trees and watch them trees move. I said, breathe, just breathe, pretend like you're that tree, you know? And so she was like, Oh, she said, yeah, I feel it. I feel so much better. We were able to go back in and, you know, maybe we should have stayed outside, but it calmed her, just calmed her right down to just stand there and watch the trees as they moved, you know. To me, that's what land-based healing is about, is being out there. Whether you're sitting by the water and watching the water go by. I remember as a kid, you know, being outside every day and just watching the leaves fall and making little crazy chips out of popsicle sticks or whatever, you know, and throwing them in the water in the springtime because it would go by, you know, in that little stream or walking a couple fields back and, you know, getting an old gas tank and riding that gas tank down the creek, you know. And I think about kids these days, they were on their little, my, my um, sister's husband calls them the dingy dingy. They're on the dingy dingy all day, every day. Those kids have never been outside. They've never walked to a field in the springtime that just, you know, was plowed up and lose your boots in the mud. They just wouldn't, they don't. And that's what they need to do, I think. That's what land-based healing is about. Going and sitting at the water with your, your fishing pole and just relaxing and breathing and laying on the ground and looking up at the stars. That is just so relaxing. 
it's letting go of all of that. Yes. Is it okay to ask a question? Maybe? Certainly. How do you um how do you keep this practice in like the dead of Buffalo winter when it's so cold and we're in the city? I'm just curious how to better engage with something like this, like when the weather pushes you inside. And you're and you're in an urban environment yeah. too, right? So I do a lot of visualization too. In the back of that book is a place called um it's uh, the comfort, the comfortable place or the safe place. And that is the best visualization I found to do. And they go to that safe place in their mind, whether it's you know, at the at the lake, at the you know, at the beach, wherever it is, lying in a pool of water. That's my go-to. Um, when I was young, my aunt took us up to the court, the lakes, and there was a um it was her friend's cottage and there was a, a lake with a what do you call it? that floating thing, a dock? And every day, that's all I did was I went out, swam to the dock, floated on the dock, floated on the water. And so my safe place visualization is lying in the water, feeling that sun feeding up the top of me and feeling that coolness behind me. And I use that when I go to the dentist because I feel really like this at the dentist. <laughs> now I did a root canal up here and I was, he was like, can you keep your mouth open? Because I was falling asleep. <laughs> and then I was, I was at, the, at the cottage, you know, just so relaxed. So I would say that use a lot of visualization. Check out that comfortable script at the back of the book. Because it is, it's hard when you're in an urban setting. How do you take them out to, you know, watch the leaves fall when there's not many around? Yes. yes, I just wanted to speak to how long it takes uh, to process trauma. I'm a clinical social worker, but I could not talk about the eight, almost nine years I spent at the Thomas Indian School mm -hmm. until I got into my 70s. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't possible. And probably a couple of years ago, I couldn't even come to a talk like this. Mm -hmm. I would say that it is not an easy process. But for me, I have clients who have been, you know, at residential school or other traumas that they've experienced. And I use EMDR. We have to do, and it's we don't do it right away, like the minute I meet them. No, we've got to build some really good rapport and they got to be able to, you know, feel like they're in a safe place. And that EMDR, uh, we do what's called a, a trauma um, history. And we divide it into big traumas and little traumas. And we go really slow, and it takes a while. It takes a couple of years to get through it. And sometimes we have to stop and just go back yeah, to the exactly. CBT, exactly. CBT or DBT or something else until we can, you know, she can feel safe enough again. But it's and not and over. I, I was a clinical social worker for 40 years, mm -hmm. and the talk is, you know, and still, it, you know, when I think the earlier the trauma, I was, I was six going on seven when I entered the school. Mm -hmm. The more prolonged it is. I was there for almost nine years. Mm -hmm. I think that that really, and, and there's there's so much about chronic PTSD. There's the, the numbing. I, I was saying to a friend of mine that when I was at the Indian school, I don't remember anybody crying ever. It's just really, really mm -hmm. terrible. The big red flag, right? Mm -hmm. and we were too frightened to cry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I would say that, yeah, you might have been a clinical social worker, but you didn't work on you, and that was hard to do, and you weren't ready to do it. And just like my, you yeah. know, my mother never spoke of it. Ever. She couldn't ever speak of it. She couldn't let herself be vulnerable enough to go there. She yeah. wasn't strong enough for that. But at least you're getting there. And that's what I hear so much, even like all of those who are on that that um, TRC, the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they said it's usually not until people get really, you know, elderly, not that I'm saying you're really an elderly girl, yeah, yeah, that yeah. they're able to to visit that, that they're able to visit that trauma. Usually they can't, they can't let themselves be that. I went, I went back on uh, Orange Shirt Day mm -hmm. last October, mm -hmm. and they were doing a tour around the, you know, Tom City School had been mostly demolished. Yeah. And a, a lot of new community buildings. But I, I have, I when I left for college, I didn't come back here for almost. I mean, stayed for any length of time until that was until two years ago. And so I didn't think I could go out on that trip. But as I went out, I, I could begin to see some of the humor in it. 
uh, I would, because I was pointing out, I said, this is the building where I sewed shirts. This is the building where I made bread. This is a, every single building which is associated with work mm -hmm. because that's all we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a self-sustaining institution, so we had to work all the time. Mm -hmm. But you didn't get to, to take part of what you made. Yeah. It was sold off mm -hmm. for the most part. That's what they did at the Mohawk Institute, too. Mm -hmm. Everything they gathered went to market, not to that. Well, I'm glad you were able to come today. When my son to... told me to come, he yeah. teaches here. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Good. Glad you're here. Any other questions? Yeah, I didn't get you half of what I wanted to, but hey, <laughs> you got a PowerPoint. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me. I feel so honored to be here. I actually worked here at UB for 15 years. I worked as, a, um, I started in biological sciences as a keyboard specialist, and then I um, worked at Cognitive Science, which was just across the way here. And um, I worked there as an administrative assistant. And then the social work program moved up here to this floor, and I started talking to Hillary and um, Barbara Rittner, and ended up applying for that, that um, BA slash MSW program and I got in and yeah, quit my job. My sisters were so mad at me. And I'm like, oh, you have a stay job with good benefits. Don't do it. What's wrong with you? And I'm like, I gotta go to school. I gotta be what I gotta do. But I got something else to do. I can't just do this all day. Although I have to say those skills have helped me along the way. You no, know, for sure. Now I go. mentioned that this book is for sale right out in the hall. We've got talking leaves here. If anybody wants to pick up a copy of this book, because I've got mine and this has been so meaningful for me to have you here and I can carry this piece with me because your words have power. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we don't have to rush out of this room, so people can some do us in it, but I gotta get ready for my class. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. And in the back of that book is also like a um, a workbook, a companion with a book, the my five favorite um forms, you know, exercises that I do with people. And I think the brain jump is in there too. Love that brain jump. And I didn't want to put them in there. My publisher said, hey, I have this idea. Why don't you put some of your worksheets in there that you use with your clients? I'm like, no, no, it's not a social work <laughs> Think about it. And I did, and I come back, I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And I am so glad that I listened to her and considered it, because that I have gotten good feedback that they really use those, those exercises. Mm -hmm. 